I'm going to try to list the major movies, the important movies on my guest today's resume. It's impossible. So let me just give you a few that he's worked on. Raiders of the Lost Ark, Star Trek The Motion Picture, Star Trek The Voyage Home, Gremlins, 48 Hours, Poltergeist, The Burbs, Aladdin, Beauty and the Beast, The Lion King, Cool Runnings, Space Jam, The Fifth Element, and who could forget Mad Max Fury Road, for which he won an Academy Award, Blade Runner 2049, Coming Soon, Dune. That's just a few of the projects Mark Mangini has been the supervising sound editor on, and he has stories to tell. I don't want to take up a lot of time with an intro because there is so much about this interview that I loved, and Mark is amazing. So let's just get right to it. You should listen to Mark because Mark has worked on so many great projects. Here we go. Thanks so much for doing this. <laughs> well, I'm glad I, I hope to have you. I hope it's worth your while. That's all I oh, have it, to say. Oh, it absolutely is. <laughs> without a doubt. I hope it's worth yours. <laughs> um, uh, well, I love I hope we get a chance to say some fun things about sound because it's important to me to proselytize a little bit and preach the importance of sound in cinema. Yeah. Well, uh, that's why you're here. Um, you've had a long and incredible career. Uh, in the sound department on feature films um, as a sound editor, supervising sound editor. But I want to go back before we talk about the recent stuff and some of your like guiding philosophy. Um, God, we spent a lot of time on this podcast and on no film school in general talking about picture. We don't spend nearly enough time talking about sound. So it's always exciting. Ah. Oh, great. Um, But I want to go back to the beginning for you and talk about what, was your sort of inspiration to pursue a career in this business and maybe even specifically in the part this part of this business? Well, the inspiration in the business in general was that I was a stop motion and hand-drawn animation filmmaker as a kid. And this goes back to the days when there was still film and my dad gave me an eight millimeter you know, home movie camera, and I loved doing stop motion and hand-drawn and pencil-colored animation. And I knew <clears throat> from very early on that I wanted to have a career in cinema of some kind, and yet, right. um, maybe we'll repeat this a number of times, but I didn't go to film school. I simply <laughs> dropped out of college where I was studying foreign languages. I was going to be a a translator. I wanted to be a translator for the UN as well, because I I realized watching the Oscars, the Oscar telecast in 1974, that um, the movies were what were my true first love. And I just threw everything inside of a car and in in my car. And I drove to LA like many kids from the East Coast do. We make the, the West Coast sojourn. So I ended up in LA just with only raw desire wanting to do something in the movie business. So some of the first gigs were in animation. Is that happenstance or was that because you were still pursuing? It's it's happenstance and it's, I when I moved to Los Angeles, I, I moved into the guest house of a friend of my dad's and he asked me one day, how's the job hunting going? And it wasn't going. And he, <laughs> and he said, what do you love to do? And I said, well, when I was a kid, I used to make cartoons on my own. So he, he took it upon himself to get me an interview at Hanna-Barbera Studios as an animator. And that caused me no amount of anxiety going into that um, interview <laughs> because I didn't really have anything to show. Um, yeah. I was more of a filmmaker than I was an artist. But the, as as fate would have it, the vice president of Hanna-Barbera liked me and um, four weeks later, he found an opening in the sound department, and that's where fate steps in and puts me um, in the sound editing department and picture editing department of Hanna Barbera Studios, the very well-known um, Saturday morning production entity that made you know the great things like the Flintstones and Huckleberry yeah. Hound and you know Scooby Doo, and I worked on all of those. Yeah, and so and you did 
you were the sound effects editor. Um, how quickly did you take to it and did it like call to you? Like, what was your relationship to that? Like sound, like, I mean, you're still doing it. So, like, <laughs> and, right. ha- and having gone from watching that 1974 yeah. Oscars to being now yeah. an Oscar winner, like, so what, <laughs> let's talk about the steps, like what uh, you're, you're thrust into sound editing, but something about it spoke to you. What I didn't complete in the, the journey from Boston to LA was this, uh, other notion that I, I'd been playing guitar all my life as a, also a songwriter and, and playing in bands. And I had this backup idea that if movies didn't work out, I'd just stay in LA and, and start a band and try to make that work. So I'd always had a, a really good ear because of my musical training as a guitarist. And I think everything connected. It was cartoons, which I loved, and sound, which I loved, and music, which I loved, and all of those skills clicked into making me a, a pretty well-suited, I don't know, candidate for sound design, because sound design ultimately al- allows me to leverage all those musical abilities of thinking in terms of tempo, timbre, uh, rhythm, tone, voicing, structure. Sound design has all those things, um, that I could bring from my experience as as a musician and as a, as a songwriter, and I would argue, and maybe we'll talk about this more in, in detail later, that um, there is no difference between uh, being a, a composer of a film score and the composer of a film sound design. We bring the exact same skill set to the jobs that we do. What is a sound supervising editor? Like that's the credit you have most of the time. What? How right. do you break it down as a role and as a position? The um, supervising sound editor is the HOD, the head of department, as they say overseas. You know, and and it's interchangeable, ideally, with sound designer or sound supervisor or right. uh, um, chef du son or any one of a number of other department head titles in, in other uh, countries. It's simply the name of the person who the filmmaker um, relates to directly and shares their vision of sound and, and, and looks to them to implement it and bring it to life. So it's the, de- yeah, it's the department head for the movie's sound. <laughs> yes, <laughs> right? exactly, the, exactly yeah. right. And, yes. and per- perhaps and, we need to define that-, that. I mean, often when I'm, I'm introduced to people and they say, yo, he's... He's the sound designer. They think that includes the music, and it's it's the one thing it actually excludes. Yes. The first feature, I think, was the first feature you worked on Star Trek The Motion Picture? You did your homework. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's yeah. not that hard with the internet these days, but I'm curious <laughs> because, like, was that the jump? It sounds like yes. <laughs> yeah, it was the jump that took a very, very brief small step before that. I had just seen Star Wars in 77, and I was still at Hanna-Barbera, and the light bulb went off. I mean, I've never been a particularly um, sort of career-obsessed human being. Like, I I never had and still don't have grand designs for myself. So the fact that I was working at Hanna-Barbera and making decent money and living in a, a little shitty apartment in North Hollywood was just a good enough life for me. Um, yeah. But then I saw Star Wars, and as it did for thousands or maybe millions of other people in, in entertainment, the light bulb went off, and I thought, hey, I can do something even cooler than this. I could reach people in movie theaters. Yeah. <laughs> and well, that's was, that, that, was that it, or was it also that, like, I mean, I talk people, we talk about Star Wars a lot. It's a seminal moment in cinema, but mm. the audio of that movie is a whole other galaxy again pun intended but like it just it creates an experience right and it was was it that it was in the theater or was it just like oh my god what are they doing here this is all so different you know like what hit you about it all of those things that you just said it was it was connecting the dots of i create sounds and i really want to talk about cartoon animation sound because it's really seminal to our discussion. Um, yeah. But I made a connection between what I was doing, getting raw footage that arguably had no sync sound to it. It's animation. There's, you know, there, nothing existed in the real world. You have to fabricate the sound of everything. Yes. And, and then I made that connection to Star Wars, and I thought, well, if I can do this in cartoons, which just, you know, 10-year-old kids are watching, 
I, I can do something even more vital. You make a great point, and it reminds me of something I've been thinking about a lot because I've been watching, I've been watching the old Looney Tunes with my son, who's almost wow, six. So great! And as we watch them, I've wa- I watched them all. I've watched them throughout my life. But something that keeps hitting me is how much the sound does. Yeah. They create emotional beats. They use music, but yeah. they use effect. Sometimes the laugh is more the sound than the visual. Yeah. And I've been thinking about it so much. And yeah. you just you just touched on it where it's like all those cartoons depend on sound to create everything from the ground up, right? It doesn't exist. <laughs> it doesn't well, exist before you get your hands on it. That's part of the joy of it is that you control the horizontal and the vertical in a cartoon. And that's one of the reasons why later on in my career, I so loved the opportunity to work on Beauty and the Beast and Aladdin and The Lion King and a number of other animated films because as sound designers, we're not encumbered by the production sound, which is often dirty and it's yeah. polluted with sounds that we don't want and we don't fully control uh, everything that, that we want to hear. Now, the, the point I wanted to make about animation sound is that to me, it was the ideal training ground as a sound designer because it teaches you very quickly to leverage metaphorical sound, which is to say, if somebody gets hit on the head, you don't hear... I don't know. Could you hear that? I'm hitting my yes, yes. I'm hitting my head with my hand. You know, there's nothing fun or funny or whimsical about that. What you want to hear is birds twittering or a or a frying pan <laughs> clang. You know, it can be anything but. In fact, it should be anything but what you're actually seeing. And that, in its essence is what sound design is all about. Thinking metaphorically about sound. You see something and you must pose the question, what could this sound like? Not what does it sound like? That's, uh, yeah. So what I was trying to say about Looney Tunes from the other side, you just articulated beautifully from an actual uh, how to do it standpoint, because that's exactly (laughs) what I was noticing. It was like, oh, it never sounds like what it is. It sounds like something magical that it's supposed to be. Or it speaks (laughs) to another reality that causes you to think. So what's amazing to me is that because of the work of people like Jimmy McDonald and Treg Brown, who was the great sound designer for the Looney Tunes movies. Now we almost can't escape this connection between being dizzy and hearing birds <laughs> twitter, right? There's no reason why when you get on hit on the head, you should hear birds twitter. But but Treg made that delicious association. <laughs> Yes. Well, we'll, you have some Looney Tunes experience we'll get to as well, of course. Um, But I, but I, you know, I just want to, you know, one of the other examples of this, I could be wrong about this, but you also worked on Raiders of the Lost Ark. And I'm curious because I remember recognizing at some point that when Indiana Jones punches people, it doesn't really sound like a punch. It almost sounds like a gun firing or something or some kind of explosion. And I'm wondering how quickly did you, because, you know, you worked on that as well as many other things we'll talk about. But that idea of connecting um, metaphor or like you say, what it could sound like or should sound like as opposed to what it does. When did you start incorporating that into live action that way? Oh, immediately. The, the beauty of it is that my early universe in sound was one of everything is metaphor in cartoons. That was the only reality I understood. So when I walked into live action sound on Star Trek and then, you know, 149 movies more after that, um, <laughs> it, it, it only seemed natural that that's exactly the way sound should be done. Because you want to always be... A, as an artist, using your imagination, and B, allowing the audience to participate in that process of helping the imagination and telling stories at the same time. I think that's the best part of what I do is that a sound can help tell a little bit of of the story in a much more efficient way than, than often exposition and words can. Can you talk a little bit more about that sort of like give examples or illustration uh, of places where you feel like you can economize some of the storytelling through through the sound? Sure. Um, we'll, we'll make up a scene here. An individual walks into a room, but you're in close up and the face doesn't give anything away. But what you hear 
and I don't know, let me see if I have, why, oh, let's see. Oh, good, so what you hear is this. I'm gonna try to belly up to the microphone. You're on somebody's face, or you could be in a medium shot, and that's what you hear. Now, what did you hear? Keys? Right, keys jingling. What does that usually imply about someone if you're looking at them and they're jingling their keys? They're going to unlock a door or open a door? I would argue it says something much more subtle. It says they're nervous. People don't jiggle their Mm. keys. And I think it's an automatic association that we make uh, when we hear that sound that speaks sentences of exposition about the mental state of that character. Especially, you know, if you see them and they're walking into a room for an interview, say. Yes, um, if they're not in front of a door, then my theory doesn't work. <laughs> sorry, I didn't, but, I didn't set that up very carefully. No, no um, but I get it. I, <laughs> I see what you're saying, that, that it, there's something distracted away from whatever they're doing. When you're doing these, these movies, like, you know, you know initially, a th- like you worked on Escape from New York, you worked on Star Trek, the motion picture, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Poltergeist. These are some of the first one, mm. big ones. The early is a, it, you know, they're like high concept. Uh, they're in other worlds or they're in. So I feel like you're called upon to create entirely new sounds yeah, as that, well as to yeah. try and create sounds that do what you're talking about, right? Yeah, that's the, uh, to use a, a word that isn't in the English language, the funnest part of the job. <laughs> uh, you know, look, every kid in the world loves to make goofy noises. We do it with our mouths from the time we're, we're infants, and we I don't think we ever give it up, <laughs> making goofy, yeah. stupid noises with our <laughs> mouths uh, or making funny sound effects. And to get paid to imagine what all these unseen things might sound like is really a treat. It's it's the proverbial uh, tabula rasa. It's the blank canvas. You're you're given a Star Trek or you're given a Blade Runner, and y- you see these things that a visual artist has dreamt up, and you're you're given sort of free reign to imagine what should or could that sound like. And that's just do they? You've worked with so many of the great directors and cinematographers do they have ideas like sound literacy is different i think filmmaking wise obviously than picture literacy yeah. do they do you talk about you know you're working on a star trek movie and you're talking about things like how does this weapon sound like nobody knows there's no right answer right no or gremlins or like <laughs> you know no. or or um, mad max where right. he wrote, like, yeah <laughs> so what is the conversation like with the other filmmakers where you're talking about what does this world sound like? I've been very fortunate to have worked with on, on a number of those movies with the Denis Villeneuve's and the, the George Millers and the Joe Dante's, to name but a few. Um, these are individuals who deeply respect the art and craft of everyone that they hire. And it's very rare that they will get granular with me about what something should sound like. Um, Uh, which is not to say we don't go through a rigorous process of review and refinement, but uh, almost to a man or woman, um, they allow me to use my first instincts as my first presentation because they they trust me. And and I'm getting goosebumps now just thinking about that kind of trust and the honor. Yeah, that's that's so cool. (laughs) So, but And and yet it it creates a huge amount of anxiety because rather than being able to grouse while I'm doing like, oh, they want it to sound like a foghorn, you know, and, and (laughs) and I'm trapped into a mold, I have, unfortunately, the universe available to me. So I have to start going through the process of looking at my blank canvas and wondering, do I start with blue or red? Um, Should I use a a camel hair brush or should I use a roller? You know, I have to start somewhere to define what it is that I want to create from scratch to present to them them for the first time. And this is where the metaphorical thinking comes into play because it's the, all those skills I learned in animation sound when you watch action and you think, okay, it shouldn't sound like what I'm seeing. It should sound like what it means. That, that, that Those are the skills that, that I start to re-employ to get me in the universe of how to design something from scratch. 
just look at all the films you've done. There's so many unique instances of films where you had to find the way to combine high concepts, the word, but like you had to combine something new with something familiar. So within the oral world of Star Trek, you know, there's one, one of the movies you did happens to be the one where they actually come to present day. Right. So <laughs> it's an example of having to combine like, oh, yeah. Star Trek sounds, but oh yeah, like San Francisco and right. the year it was made. Yeah. But also similarly, you know, Gremlins or The Burbs are movies where they combine some some crazy element with something, hey, it's just the suburbs or it's, you know, gremlins, yeah. it's our world. Yeah. What is that? If, if that's something you've had to do repeatedly, how is that, you know, you say even when you're doing a regular sound, you make it, you, you try to find the meaning or the subtext yeah. or the metaphor. Yeah. But when you're trying to differentiate worlds, mm. um, do you have like different sound worlds competing in the same movie telling the story? No, the story is everything. And I like to say that um, whether you're a sound designer or a director of photography or a costumer, our first goal is to simply tell the story. And there's really only one story that we're trying to tell. And the best sound is the one that honors that story as closely as possible. So um, everything has to live within that universe. That's, that's your unifying concept. Yeah. Does that no, make sense? I mean, that, did did yeah. that answer your no, question? It, I'm not yes, sure absolutely. No, no, it makes total sense to me. The idea that it's just that sometimes I could see that, that it becomes complicated to try and combine, you know, what this place sounds like in the spaceship, but it's also a, but then we're in the city, yeah. you know, but you're saying you take it moment by moment yeah. and serve the story as you go, whatever that is. It, it feels kind of simple to me, but maybe uh, I, I've done it for so long, it, it isn't as simple as it appears. Um, sure. When I met George Miller on Mad Max, he presented me with his philosophy of filmmaking, uh, uh, graphically represented by his um, pyramid. I'm trying to remember what specific name, name he gave. The I'll call it the pyramid of importance. And if, if imagine a pyramid, and at the top is the crown, and you bisect the pyramid with three or four lines. So there's something at the very top that's the cornerstone, and then below it are like two blocks, and then below that two blocks are three blocks. And he said, in any given shot, there's only one thing I want to draw the audience's attention to, and that's sort of our peak sound. And he says, inversely, visually, I, I only want the audience to be looking in one place. Um, and he said, just below that are maybe two subservient sounds. But in any given granular moment, any given shot, we are going to tell the story with, with just one sound because that's what the audience can't um, parse any more than that. There's so much information coming at them. So uh, George used this pyramid representation to demonstrate how we try to focus the audience's attention moment to moment granularly with the things that we show and we, and we, we hear. That's so uh, fascinating and uh, educational because one of the things that makes that movie excellent is that for everything going on in it, in a world of, of visual and auditory noise yeah. and content, Chaos. it really tells you exactly what's... You never feel confused or lost. You know it's very satisfying. On a basic level, when you're watching it, you experience that movie, you know where you're supposed to look yeah. and you know what you're supposed to experience. Right. And I think sometimes uh, you the, the blockbuster era... There's, there's sort of this disease of more. Oh, like it's just like yeah. so much on the screen, yeah, right? Yeah. So much in your ear. Yeah. That's such a great unifying theory. Did that, that obviously resonated with you, I guess. Cause you oh, know, hugely. but that, did that, uh, you know, that tell, <laughs> tell me about the two supporting sounds. So okay. what does that mean? Like, uh, okay. Like uh, you've got this one key sound and yeah. then these two supporting yeah. sounds. Like how does that work in practice? Let me get back to your, your very astute observation um, about how important that is. We like to joke in the sound community because poorly made movies don't know how to separate the wheat from the chaff. There, there's just too much going on. And mm. we like to say um, the Academy uh, of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences doesn't give an award for the most sound. They give it the award <laughs> for best sound. <laughs> and we, one must remember that silence and reductiveness is a choice. 
And yeah. we are often confused as sound designers as well as costumers and editors. You know, everybody yeah. thinks that great film editing is about making more, the more edits you make, the better it must be, or the more color, the more fabrics, or the more whatever camera moves. It isn't about more. It's about yeah. right. It's about what is right yeah. for this specific moment. But to get back to your question, there's always one kind of what we call hero sound that is the focus of that shot. And Mad Max had something like 2,800 individual shots. So there's always at least one hero sound in every single moment of the movie. But of course, a hero sound like, um, let me see, uh, the the war rig. There's moments where we, you feature the sound of Furiosa's truck. Um, yes. But it doesn't live in a vacuum. It lives in a desert where you want to hear some wind sounds and maybe there's some metal doors rattling and she, there's some other subservient sounds of of them uh, moving around in the in the cab of the truck. So uh, you have a hero sound and that's what we're making sure we telegraph to the audience, but we always have to support it to create verisimilitude. Since that film, like many big blockbuster movies, is predominantly ADR or automated dialogue replacement or meaning we replace the dialogue. It's not the sync sound that was recorded when the film was captured. There, there, yes. There's no ambiences. There's no reality to inform uh, that shot. So we have to bring the actor or actress in to record their voices. And then we have to fill back in everything that you would have heard in meticulous detail. That starts with the hero sound top of the pyramid. Oh, I'm sorry. That's what George called his philosophy, top of the pyramid. And then there were these subservient sounds that had to build in the reality around the top of the pyramid. I am, I'm just smiling because it's such a beautiful unifying theme. <laughs> I'm just thinking <laughs> about it, like that idea of, uh, I think film, I think young people, I think filmmakers in general, and I don't blame them. It's easy to get lost in all the things you can do yeah. and all the things you can create yeah. and you're recording sound. And then you think you're yeah. layering in more yeah. sound and you try to yeah. get as many cool things in your shot as yeah. possible or whatever it is. But to be able to identify when you need nothingness or yeah. when you need blank yeah. and to also be able to say, uh, this is, you know, this is the key sound, but what makes this hero sound work is like, I, you just, as you just illustrated, like a rusty door or right. the sound of the desert or whatever right. it is. Uh, yeah. It's just, uh, it's why, it's, it's why that movie works so well, but like so many of these movies, um, you know, talk about, uh, I'd like to hear about things like Dune and Blade Runner, which mm -hmm. are completely <laughs> different worlds you're creating. What is the experience like, you know, uh, I guess Dune and Blade Runner, you're, you're working with Denny's again on both of those. Yeah. Do you have a sort of a shorthand there? How do you guys talk about creating those oral worlds? Um, one of the special things about um, my relationship with Denis on Blade Runner and with Dune is that he's very keenly aware of the special relationship between um, sound and music. And he recognizes that often they want to inhabit the same soundtrack, but they don't always inhabit uh, in a friendly way. And he's very, very um, judicious about how he parses out where sound is carrying the top of the pyramid and where music is carrying the top of the pyramid. And yet he recognizes that often if we can disassociate the audience from their inner filmmaker and have them stop making mental notes about that was good music, that was good sound, <laughs> and, and simply wondering, I don't know if that was music or sound. And I love that. that was his so first cool. directive to Theo Green and I, my co-sound designer on Blade Runner 2049. He said, this. it was as simple as this in my first meeting with him. He said, I want you to compose with sound. And now you must have loved that because that's uh, like your whole philosophy. It's mixing way, my right? musical skills and my my sort of holistic approach to sound because to me there is no difference between uh, a musical score and sound design. It's all composition work. We're all we're, we are both the composer and I using the exact sk same skill set, except that 
I would argue that my palette is far wider because I'm not limited to a 12-tone scale or traditional instruments. <laughs> I can right. use anything, and, and including a dissonance and, and harmony. Not that a composer can't, but often, of course, the sound effects are the most dissonant part of the soundtrack of a, of a movie. You also have to use people's words, like human right. speaking. You know, there's, there's a huge part there's of it. There's something yeah. fascinating about that to me too, in that, you know, we've talked sort of about the idea of connotative meaning and denotative meaning here. Mm. Like someone can say something, they can mean something different. So mm -hmm. when you're composing sound, there's the tone of you, you yes. recorded dialogue. There's their tone, yeah. but there's what do the words mean, right. but do the words and what they mean can, uh, match up or not match up right. with what the rest of the world sounds like. Right. Uh, that's all fascinating. But um, that, that I created a term for that that I call nonverbal narration. That's what that sort of connotative uh, sound design is, is you can say something about the story without ever using a word and it can be not related to what you're seeing or it could be sympathetic yeah. with what you're seeing it all depends on where the filmmaker wants the story to go you may be looking at a happy character but you may be hearing frightening and anxiety producing sounds that this yes. is how we manipulate the audience through their that back door that subconscious mode that they're not really aware of but it's more viscerally reacting to yes people are often more scared or you, you can I always tell people you can tell sometimes where the movie or the scene is going by what the sound is doing, <laughs> not just by what the image is doing. The sound is giving you cues, right? But yeah. uh, what this is something that I'm I'm so fascinated by. But when we talk a lot about screenwriting and the words on the page, and screenwriters often will have like you know intent behind things. Mm -hmm. They try to put it in the margins, right. so to speak, or yeah. in the description, but. Yeah. Where do you, as the, when you come to the other side of the, of the process, right? There's that screenwriter at the beginning, then there's you and the composer at the other side. Right. Like, <laughs> is that, what, does that subtext or that intent make it? And sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Are you ever looking for it? I mean, I, I guess what I'm asking, how do I ask this? It's a complicated question, but if there, if, if you sense something there that wasn't necessarily in the script, or do you often find that the intent is followed through, the director brought it to you, and then you you create it, subtext or meaning um, behind I, the, the obvious? I like to believe that I'm, I'm a writer's best friend in that if the intent was realized through a great direction and acting, we simply support that even further with sound. And yet, not every scene in a film, no matter how well written or, or how well directed, <clears throat> comes off as intended. It's less common for a writer and I to communicate, although it happens, but much more common for a director to be very forthcoming and say, this scene didn't turn out exactly the way I wanted it. It's not as a um, happy, as uh, soothing, as anxiety riddled, as scary as I wanted it to be visually what can we do with sound to help that or inversely um I, you know they, they may ask me to play against uh the way the scene was written because they've realized that it, it supports the story in a very different way that no one had anticipated of course a uh, you know a movie is this unknown beast it's until it's birthed and it's got writing and directing and acting and cinematography and sound and music you almost often don't know what you have until it's kind of all put together and you're all looking at yeah. it and realizing, oh, this is what we made. Maybe we better <laughs> make some alterations over there so that they pay off further on down the line. And yes, so often that's... I am working against, I shouldn't say often, I have, and I find that to be a, a, a fun skill of trying to make a scene work better than maybe anyone intended by saying to the director, hey, what if we used sound this way? What would that say about this character or this moment in the movie? So sometimes you all see that thing, that finished thing, that you all worked on different parts of this body. You finally see the whole body. Yeah. And then you might say, you know what? The leg over here, I have a sound idea that right. can help it function Exa better. Exactly right. And you come exactly to the director right. and suggest something like that. That's fascinating. Exactly again, right. I don't know that enough people recognize that it's hard to see the whole thing until everybody's 
done with the yeah. pass. Um, uh, I'm, I'm hoping to... when you see Dune, um, I'm, I'm quite proud of, uh, of a narrative concept that I developed my first week on the film, my first meeting with Denis, that is not quite spoken to in the Herbert books. It's alluded to in the Herbert books, and I can't tell you any more than this, otherwise I'll have to kill you. The, uh, <laughs> but um, I, think, I think even Herbert himself, when he sees what we've done with some voice work, would 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 give us a, a bravo in terms of how it ties together a, a a group of universes that we didn't think of quite in that way until we started applying ourselves to a specific sound problem in Dune. That's so exciting. <laughs> that makes me very excited <laughs> to see it. That is a project where, you know, aside from the massiveness of the of the original words on the page of the book and Frank Herbert. And the the task of bringing it to life on so many levels, uh, I'm just so curious what the process was like in creating the soundscape for that yeah, world. Uh, I, did you did you go to some of the other, you know, the earlier film? Look at that. Did you just talk yeah. about what the intent was behind some of the the novel, um, creating new things entirely? Um, maybe you could just tell us even. How do you create a new sound? Do you do you combine <laughs> effects like that exist to make something new? I mean, I've I've heard people talk about doing that before. Um, what is that process like? I mean, you've worked on things like you know, Dune, Blade Runner twenty forty nine, The Fifth Element, like mm. a lot of sci fi, yeah, a lot of like times. for Star Trek stuff too. Star Trek, yeah. yeah, it's been a good genre for me. <laughs> um, you know. I, that's a whole nother podcast. Um, okay, I, I, <laughs> fair I, enough. I, I would say this, that um, when I'm designing sound, let, let's just narrow the, the, the universe a little bit. If I'm making the sound of something we've never seen or heard before, th th that's one approach versus uh, building sound for things we have seen and heard before, but I want to build in a unique and unusual way. So right. um, even... That was your slapping the head example earlier. Was it doesn't sound like that? It might sound like the right. pan or the birds. Well, or, but yeah. well, well, let's let's go let's go back to basics for just a second. It, yeah. th there's a great metaphor in um, fine cooking that aptly describes how we sound designers need to approach our work, and that is this: the best meals are always made from the freshest ingredients. And what that means is, even though I may have a sound library full of sounds of, let's say, Pig Dune, for example, I've got winds and I've got desert sounds, but I wanted the freshest, newest, most high fidelity ones. So I nonetheless went out to Mojave and recorded the desert again um, because I wanted the freshest, newest ingredients. And that's, yeah. that's how any self-respecting um, sound designer would begin their process, which is a what I'll call the gathering mode. You watch the, the project in its entirety and you make notes of what you need either for things that you want fresh and new that no one has ever heard quite the same way before and to f identify unusual sound uh, occurrences that might be fodder for later manipulation when you're designing sounds for things you've never heard before. I'll give you an example. <laughs> when I heard about uh, Dune two years ago, I, I knew I wanted to rethink the way I've been doing spaceship sounds. Spaceships, you know, the kinds in science fiction movies aren't the same as, you know, space shuttles and, and Dragon Xs. You know, those aren't the sounds we want for a future futuristic movie. So I got yeah. to thinking about the metaphors that I could think of that would apply to a sound I wanted to record that I could manipulate later. And I remembered stumbling in my library upon the sound of a, a Tibetan longhorn that I, that I loved, that I used in Blade Runner 2049 to great effect on um, some spaceships. So for this film, I was determined to record a tuba and make spaceships out of it. My youngest son and I happen to have a long-standing ritual. He's a composer of buying each other new musical instruments every Christmas. So this past <laughs> Christmas, he bought me a sousaphone, the biggest, the world's biggest brass instrument, those giant marching band <laughs> things with the huge <laughs> bell that's like five feet across. Uh, yeah. So I don't play sousaphone. I don't even have an embouchure. I can't even blow it. But I could blow it well enough to make a bunch of really deep, 
um, brassy kind of um, horn-like uh, sounds that I would then later manipulate into the sounds of spaceships for Dune. Wow, so th- that's there's, so cool. There's a quick example of how, you know, we're always looking for things in the world that make interesting noises that when we remove them from their... Uh, their context. Their context. Thank you. That was the word I've been looking for. Remove yeah. and we recontextualize. That's a big part yeah. of what sound designers do is recontextualize. Here's the the best example I can think of. If you love the Looney Tunes cartoons, the sound of the Tasmanian devil, the spinning pa- Tasmanian devil, is the sound of a a biplane's inertia starter. This crank hand crank device that makes a prop plane's engine start that goes and speeds up till it's spinning maniacally it was the perfect recontextualization of a sound for something that we're seeing visually that resembles it because the you know the the tasmanian devil's spinning around manically like the propeller on an airplane that's the genius of treg brown yes how crazy is it that we see sound that way it's just fascinating to me. Like we do see sound. When we hear something, it's a, there's a visual component before it's associated. So there's a match sometimes like that that you don't even realize exists until well, it happens. Well, there, there's secret number two uh, <laughs> of great sound design is that we look for visual metaphors to point us towards the sonic uh, sounds that, that, that might help represent them. So for example, yeah. in Star Trek IV, there was this really important sound sequence where the bird of prey is crashing back through the clouds and it lands in San Francisco Bay and it's a terrifying sequence where they've lost power they're not going to pull out of this dive and visually the first thing I thought of were the World War II movies uh, where I saw dogfights and if if an airplane got hit bad and it plummets into the into the drink as they used to say into the ocean it would be accompanied yeah. by this very classic library sound we called strut wine that was like <laughs> yes, and anyone yes. no matter what age you could be from 1 to 100 <laughs> if you hear that sound you know it's the sound of an airplane out of control so I thought that's the sound I need for the bird of prey crash landing in the in San Francisco Bay because I added other sounds to it, but I knew the audience would immediately identify with out of control gonna crash, and it added it adds that extra layer of 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 impending danger. That's so cool. Yeah, it's a it's a cue. It's an auditory yeah. cue, right? Yeah, it but triggers it. it triggers subconscious things. Yeah, somebody sub- yeah. should do a psychological. Uh, profile of what happens in the brain when we watch movies. And well, they have, them. It's, it's a great point, though, because that stuff has been done and done, and we've done it on No Film School, about color and about visuals. But sound Mm-mm. has all of that. There, yeah. And you say, you say it's a secret. It, 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 there is so much that's happening in our minds when we're experiencing the sound in a movie yeah. um, that we're not aware of. That's that, that's like a subconscious process, um, just as much as the eyes. Um, you know, I wanted to also bring up a couple other things. I want, oh, uh, before that... I forget, I'm sorry, don't lose that thought. Um, George Miller, when we finished Mad Max and he, he got up to thank everyone, part of this speech was of a quote that I've put in my blog. He said, quote, Mad Max is a film we see with our ears. Mm, yeah. I just thought that was really that's profound. Good. I'm sorry, I didn't yeah. mean to interrupt you. No, that's uh, that's great. What's your blog? So we can tell people um, to check it out. Markmangini.com. Uh, it's a, it, it has uh, my blog on it. It has photographs I've taken on all my crazy sound adventures. It's got... Um, I don't know, my resume and a bunch of Yeah, other, that but, sounds cool. Uh, also what, a library you, for great read uh, with recommendations of great reading for sound. When you go um, out, you say like for Dune, you were like, I need the best fresh ingredients, which is a great metaphor. Yeah. When you go out to get them, I, I imagine the, the stuff you take with you to record and to, you know, is different all the time because there's yeah. constantly evolving technology. But what is it nowadays? And do you ever, second part, <laughs> do you ever say like, I want to record it on something old and different to distort it or, or create a different experience? <laughs> Uh, boy, you, boy, you do a lot of homework. I'm really impressed. <laughs> I'm really impressed. <laughs> well, thank you. If you if you run out of time and you're like, no, that quite, that's too much for me. I'm not answering. Oh no, I, I can talk to... about sound for days. Um, well, yes, you very very appropriately recognized that 
um, every expedition, um, th there's probably a newer recorder or microphone or methodology of recording to present my sound in a newer, fresher way. So, for example, the last time I did a movie that took place in the desert and I got desert sounds, all I had was a stereo recorder and a stereo, meaning two microphones. And those are great recordings. But this is the age of immersive audio, Dolby Atmos and Oro yes. and, and IMAX, and we need to immerse and surround and envelop the audience with sound. And I didn't feel as though, as good as those old recordings are, that they were enough for a modern movie. So it was time to go back out into the field with more microphones and more channels of recording and higher sample rate digital files. Right. And, you know, all the stuff that technology brings us over the years, I, we have to schlep out with Sherpas uh, in, the, <laughs> in the noonday sun. Uh, I mean, we had to carry, you know, gallons and gallons of water and sun protection and tents. And we literally um, hiked for three miles to get out to a quite enough place to stage the recordings that we needed to stage to get uh, wow. the desert sounds that we were. And it was it was brutal. So. So, yes, we're always working on new ways of recording sound to get the freshest and perhaps the most immersive but inversely, you, you've probably read that sometimes we like to revert to the old analog techniques to create either um, that anachronistic verisimilitude. We, we, we mm -hmm. want something to sound like from an old 50s television show. Mm -hmm. So we'll go research the old microphones and the old analog recorders and bring out reel-to-reel -reel tape, which nobody uses anymore. But it, yes. it's, you know, it's somewhat of a gimmick now, but it's a useful gimmick for certain things. And, and, and I'll give you the best example. Um, analog tape does something that is very similar or akin to what the human ear does. At a certain sound pressure level, your eardrums collapse and compress. And that's exactly what analog tape does. And so the way to get the best gunshot recordings, which are very high sound pressure levels, we often bring an analog tape-based recorder out into the field to capture it because the tape wow. mimics the way we hear it. And when we hear it, something reproduced in a movie the way we think we hear it in real life, we ascribe it reality. And that gets to a uh, bigger discussion of yes. a suspension of disbelief. The more right. we in sound or any other discipline of cinema can allow you to suspend disbelief, the more time you have to actually pay attention to the story. Mm. So if I can mimic what the ear is doing and make you sign off subconsciously, oh, that sounded like a gunshot. <laughs> you don't have right. to think about it anymore. Right. Whereas if it sounds like, you know, a slide whistle, then suddenly the story <laughs> becomes secondary to that strange experience. Yeah, that that'd be a very have. strange experience. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> but that um, that's fascinating. I mean, that again, like I think to speak to the power of the sound designer, that is the ability to determine the experience of the movie. Like, is it going to sound exactly like the real gunshot? Right. Or is it going to sound a little different for some reason? Right. Um, you know, that the gu uh... guns are a great example because there is a really great example of this. I purvey some of my sound library online through a great company called ProSoundEffects.com. And they've produced a series of videos on how sound design works. And one of them was on gunshots. And I, I talk mm. in depth about this. And so I encourage some of the listeners to go seek that out. Only because in a simple shot... Of a, of a person firing a gun, you can say a hundred things about that character, depending on yeah. uh, how high fidelity, low fidelity, loud, small, big, distant. There's a hundred ways to develop that sound to say something about the character. One of the most common things you'll hear about films or content people are creating, video, whatever, is that they didn't put enough into the sound, they put too much elsewhere. There are so many ways having access to libraries, but more importantly, access to understanding what the choices mean mm -hmm. and how they impact the experience of the story yeah. is just so useful. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, are, what kind of resources, what would you recommend somebody to do if they're, you know, they're making an indie feature or how would you recommend they go about developing the sound for their film if they can't necessarily hire somebody who specializes in it 
but they're going to end mm. up supervising it or editing it themselves or, mm. you know, looking for audio. It all depends on the budget level, but I'll take a few things for granted um, or not for granted. The single most important aspect of your movie is the dialogue and that deserves the most attention to financial resources and time. So, you know, the giveaway, the tell of an amateur production is bad production dialogue. In the worst cases, the microphone was on the camera and they didn't even hire a boom person or spring for lavalier microphones and wireless transmitters and receivers. Um, you yes. know, if you're going to spend anywhere, it's, it should be to get great production sound and everything else will, will follow from there. If you don't do that, no amount of Mark Manginiizing after the fact <laughs> in, in post-production is going to help you. You're, you're a dead duck. Yeah. That's, I mean, that, yes, that is true. Um, assuming you get good production sound, <laughs> you hire somebody on set, you have a mixer. Yeah. Um, there's so much you can do, uh, you know, obviously using a tool like Pro Tools, um, getting access to a library, uh, recording the stuff on your own. Like you yeah. said, obviously they're not going to get the yeah. rigs you have to go right. out into the desert, but, you know, recording additional sound elements like that, 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 that that's that's the key you know the fresh ingredients thing is the, is the, maybe the next most important thing to remember um even if you don't have a library you know if it's not a, a science fiction film where you're designing everything there's so much you can do i can tell you shamefully that often i'm out with my little 70 dollar two channel zoom recorder because it fits in my back pocket i can't bring out my big rig all the time so i always have some kind of handy dandy a uh, little pocket recorder that records pretty well. And um, you can do an extraordinary job with some of these low-priced uh, handheld recorders capturing atmospheres and spot effects and, you know, sounds around the house to be manipulated into your, something later. Is it your equivalent of the the notepad in your back pocket? Do you ever, you come across yeah. a sound or an environment and you're like, I want to have yeah. a reference yeah, for this exactly. or I, I may not use this but i want to capture it and listen to it later oh no i'm going further than that the even these little 70 dollar recorders are good enough to put in real movies and even movies like dune have sounds made on these little hundred dollar oh, wow. recorders they, they do a pretty darn good job and then what it does is it's so convenient it develops a, a habit of capturing constantly and that's a habit every erstwhile sound designer should develop, which is record everything. My library has 607,000 sounds in it, individual sound files. It's, <laughs> it's one of the largest sound libraries in the world. And I'm wow. still collecting to this today because I'm always saying to myself, I never know when I'm going to use this, but I bet you I will someday. Yeah. Well, your the fresh ingredients metaphor is so cool for that reason because it's like, well, I may have it, but I may not have it the way it should be now the way it sounds today. I mean, yeah. a car sounds a lot different now than it did five or 10 years ago. Like, you know, everything sounds different constantly. Yeah. It's all changing. We're, right? we're always recording. So I usually end with, with something like this, a question like this, and I'm really curious your answer. Okay. Um, <laughs> you know, what, what advice would you give somebody today on getting started, finding their way into this industry? I mean, you, mm. like you said at the beginning, you were inspired by you know wanting to make movies making cartoons if it's in sound or if it's just in this field in general you've been in it a long time you succeeded worked with all the greats of multiple eras <laughs> you know what would you how would you advise what have you observed for someone looking for a start what i've observed and i i can proudly say that i've, I've, I've followed this advice as well many times is that passion and commitment will always be rewarded, which is to say, if you think sound is your thing, um, you need to live and eat and breathe it every day. You should be, A, every day, making time in your day to listen to the world and think about why does the world sound the way it sounds. And then you should, after you've done a fair amount of that, and it should never stop, you should go out and start recording the world and building up a library because then you have a facility for understanding the translation between what you thought you heard with your ears and how something reproduces over speakers after you bring it into your workstation or whatever you're working with. Um, and then um, you have to start 
building sound whether you've been asked to or not. You have to practice this craft of listening, recording, editing, and designing constantly whether you have a project or not. Uh, and that means even, and I've had this brought to me, taking other sound designers' works, you know, rip something off of a DVD or a Blu-ray, strip out mm. the sound that Mark Mangini made, and do your version of it. And I say that because I've had those exact things happen to me, and those were the people that impressed me the most, and those were the people, out of the thousands I interview from film schools, those are the ones I hired because I knew huh. they weren't hedging their bets about, oh, I'm not sure if I should be a producer. I think I'm, I like sound right now. Not going to cut it. You'll never get a job that way. This has to mm. be what you've decided on. And then you have to live and breathe it and practice it every day so that when you're in the crunch on a $200 million movie and an important director turns to you and says, this sound doesn't work, what should we do? You should not only have a series of scars and in your and your head from the mistakes you made trying to solve that problem but you should also have an immediate series of reflexive reactions just like great athletes know the moves they don't even have to think about them anymore they just yeah. do them you should you should have done these things a hundred times before the critical situation presents itself and you have to do it on the spot that's uh, great advice i've never thought about that before so you're saying like no you know, having gone through the steps so many times that it's a uh, it's a knee jerk of like, oh, I know what the options are and I know what the best one is. Well, let's put it this way. It's very valuable for it to be a knee jerk 90 percent of the time. None of us are geniuses. And sure. I, I will say to a George Miller, or a Denis Villeneuve, uh, uh, you know, I'm not exactly sure what to do about this right now, but I'm going to work on it and get back to you. But a good portion of the time I'll say, Oh, I know what to do. And, you know, in my mind's ear, I'm hearing something I did on a Star Trek or a Gremlins or a, or a, a Scooby-Doo because I remembered confronting that same exact challenge. Now I just have to apply the new circumstances to it. And you think also that idea of, of, of stripping the sound off of a picture entirely and building it again by yourself oh, is like huge. building those scars and yeah. those pieces of knowledge for the person because maybe they weren't you and they weren't sitting with Leonard Nimoy on Star Trek, right. but they've redone it and now they have ideas and thoughts about how to redo it, right? When you go through that process of creation, the bizarre unexplained uh, inspirations that come to you from, we don't know where they come from, surprise all of us and you might think you know what i think i like this better than what mark did and here's a, and, and that's, <laughs> that's beautiful cool. and i love that and i've seen that and experienced that yeah and and you know this that's... is all part of that whole ten thousand hours thing you can't be an yes. expert until you put in the time and if you're just waiting for somebody to hire you to get the hours in you're not going to progress like the person who's doing it every day because they're hungry because it means something to them well, you make it sound fun to do, which is also cool. <laughs> yeah. Like, I mean, your passion, your passion for doing it makes it sound like something people like. It's like, why wouldn't you want to put all the time in and make all like it? It's it sounds like a creative buffet <laughs> creating the sound for a movie. <laughs> yeah. uh, so it's exciting to think about it that way. And I honestly now I'm like more excited to see Dune than I was because now mm -hmm. I'm going to be thinking about some of these sound things. <laughs> Well, you know, the, the part of it is my culture. I'm 100% Italian, so I'm convinced there's a little Geppetto in me or there's a little <laughs> Michelangelo in me that cannot... I, I, I take joy in what I've produced, whether anybody else enjoys it or not. But I also know the giddy sense of elation that I get when I'm... I, I, the, you know, the, the light bulb went off in the creative process. I'm staring at the blank screen and... Ding. Oh, that's what I want to do. And then two hours later, I'm done and I'm sweating and I play it back for myself. And I think, oh, I can't wait to play this for the guys. That, I, you know, that <laughs> to me is, is, you know, an indescribable joy of life, whether it's a great yeah. game of golf or it's a, it's a sound design. Anytime you can, you know, provide that, that joy for yourself, you know, we're, you're, you're alive. Yeah. Well, that's really well said. Thank you so much, Mark, for taking the time. It's been really fun. Thanks for asking like really, really good questions. It, it, it's, it's a joy. <laughs> I 
hope you enjoyed my interview with Mark Mangini. Thank you for listening. Thank you to Mark for coming on the podcast and for his insane contribution to the world of cinema sound. I learned a lot talking to him. I hope you learned a lot listening. It was, again, just a joy to uh, chat film and film sound with somebody who's done it for as long and as well as Mark has. Um, Check out everything going on with Sound Week on nofilmschool.com. We have tons of content related to sound, sound editing, sound recording, production sound, room tone, the whole deal. And of course, all our filmmaking content at nofilmschool.com. Follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, like, rate, subscribe to the podcast, check out our other interviews, as well as our weekly podcast show where we cover the week in film and filmmaking news. Thanks so much for listening. 